Just three days ago, South Africa marked the passing of Prince Mangosutu Butelezi, a figure whose contributions and decisions during our nation's pivotal transition to democracy continue to be a topic of reflection and debate. Welcome to Unfiltered, I'm Sizwe Mbofu Walsh. Tonight, we delve into the multifaceted roles, actions and legacies associated with Prince Butelezi during that transformative era of South African history. Joining me for this exploration via Zoom are Nkuleko Lengwa, Ngata Freedom Party spokesperson, former Democratic Alliance Party leader Tony Leon, Zolani Mkiva, General Secretary of Contra Lesa, and in studio we're joined by Dr. Sipo Sitole from the Institute of Advanced Study, University of Johannesburg. But first, let's gain perspective with this insert produced by Andrew Mohatle. I want to say emphatically that they, I was never involved in any formation of any hit squads against anybody. And I can say before my creator that I've never been involved in any decision to kill one single person, nor has the IFP been involved in such, in such activity. The passing of 95-year-old Prince Mango Sutu Butelezi continues to elicit mixed reactions across the length and breadth of South Africa. While all agree that he has had an impact in South Africa's body politic, his legacy remains contested. A lot of other people, um, you know, mentioned this, people like Eugene de Kock uh, and others when we were going through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a nation, that um, they admitted to the fact that, for instance, the apartheid um, police was highly involved in the provision of arms in the hostels during the fight that happened during the war that erupted between the ANC and the Ingata Freedom Party um, as part of the disagreements re regarding the negotiations. Words are important. She says there was violence, uh, which she then places at the door of one Prince Butelezi and the leadership of the ANC. So you can see that there is a sanitization of this issue. Leanne, let me be categoric. Yesterday, we had the leadership of the ANC visiting the Butelezi family. And there is an acknowledgement that there is a need to continue the reconciliation agenda between the two parties on the basis that 20,000 people died in the low intensity black on black civil war. Of those 20,000, 12,000 were members of the IFP and leaders of the IFP. Have been drawn into violence. An apartheid collaborator to some on whose shoulders blame must be put for the deaths of many a struggle hero who only fought for the preservation of his Zulu people, their land and recognition in the new South Africa. Post-democracy, through various interventions, the intense violence was thwarted even though political killings continue, especially in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. Butelezi is acknowledged for his role in ensuring the preservation of the Zulu royalty and land through the controversial Ingonyama Trust. But following the installment of the current King Mrs. Zulu, for whom he vigorously fought as kinship remains contested, he increasingly became disillusioned with what he believed to be the interference of the ANC in the royal house, which he said sowed divisions and wanted to take away the land of the Zulus during disagreements about the leadership of the Ingonama Trust. With more talk of reconciliation efforts between the AFP and the African National Congress, it is not clear what the scope of these talks are and whether it will be possible for the two parties to completely bury the hatchet. Prince Butelezi will be laid to rest on Saturday and only time will tell whether his legacy will be able to hold his own party, the IFP United, and positively influence the already strained relations with his former party, the ANC. And Rumukate, unfiltered, SABC News.
Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're discussing the life and legacy of Prince Mangosutu Butelezi. Mr. Sengwa, could I begin with you? And firstly, I appreciate that this must be a difficult time for you personally and for the party. So thank you for taking the time at this sensitive moment to speak to us on Unfiltered. No, thank you very much, Butelezi. Uh, good evening uh, to you and the viewers at home and to the uh, fellow panelists, and thank you very much for affording us an opportunity to be part and parcel um, of this very important discussion about a great life. My condolences to you. I'm sure it's a difficult moment. Thank you. Could I just begin with some some updates, since we do have you, and you have largely been speaking for the party on this on this matter. Uh, firstly, just your your quick reaction to the announcement today about the upgrading of the funeral, or, or the announcement that the funeral will be a stage one state funeral. Um, the Butelezi family and the Mzela family is very appreciative and thankful to President Cyril Ramaphosa and the government of the Republic of South Africa for granting Prince Mangosu to Butelezi a special funeral, official funeral category one, in recognizing his role and contribution and leadership in South Africa in the different uh, facets of life and initiatives, mission and vision in which he carried out. The family did this morning um, convey their thanks to the president and the deputy president of the republic has just left the family home a short while ago where they've again, um, you know, uh, expressed their appreciation. We believe it's befitting and we as a party join the family um, in uh, appreciating uh, this as well. The Prince Mangosu Tupitel is the foundation itself is also uh, appreciative. Uh, the funeral will take place uh, on Saturday at the Prince Mangosu Tupitel is the regional stadium in Ulundi, uh, starting at nine o'clock. And all South Africans are welcome to attend. Tomorrow, the IFP is holding a national memorial service at the stadium precinct practice pitch, uh, again also scheduled um, to start at nine o'clock. Further um, celebrations and memorials will take place after the funeral on Saturday, where the party leadership uh, with the family uh, will actually also be announcing this and involved. And the final one is to say the Mangosu University of Technology um, is hosting a memorial service on Thursday as well between uh, 10 and 1 o'clock. And again, the two uh, South Africans are welcome to attend. From our side, it's all systems go, and we are hopeful that we'll be able to carry out um, the funeral services and the memorials in a manner which will uh, be fitting the statue of the man. Right, and just briefly, if I may, you were visited by uh political party leaders from uh, the EFF, from the DA, and of course the deputy president today. Um, those delegations, I take it, were, were received. Um, and and uh, can you give us any updates in terms of how that process unfolded? Right, I think we may have lost uh, Mr. Klengwa, who's, who's uh, of course, in, in a very- oh, Sorry about uh, that. Uh, no problem. Yeah. We will we'll come back to you, Mr. Tlengwa, as you, because sure. uh, we, we appreciate that it's a very busy time for you. Mr. Leon, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us as well. You have joined uh, an array of observers who have uh, wished the Butelezi family well, but also described his legacy as complex. Could I ask you, in terms of the particular moment of history that we're looking at, the moment of South Africa's democratic transition, how you characterize and reflect on the the life and legacy of Prince Mutelezi? Well, I, I think it's a very large legacy. And uh, as Walt Whitman said, you know, I am large, I contain multitudes because uh, I, I think, well, ever since I was a, a child of primary schools a long time ago in Durban, uh, Chief Mutelezi, as he was then known, was a very big figure in the province of Natal and was very much seen as an opponent uh, of the apartheid system. And yet he also participated in what were apartheid structures. He perhaps did so in a rather unique way because unlike other homeland leaders, he didn't accept uh, independence, which was a very big sticking point between him and the National Party government. And then at the very point of transition after February 1990, when uh, Butlezi, who had actually campaigned alongside my old party, the PFP, to have a national convention 
the national convention happened and the release of Nelson Mandela had occurred, another key issue on which uh, Manga Sutubu-Lezi had campaigned uh, to his great credit, and the negotiations commenced at uh, Kempton Park in December 1991, really right through until the final constitution was negotiated in 1996 in May in Parliament, of which we were all members by then. Chief Butlesi and the IFP did not participate in those uh, negotiations, or they withdrew from them. Now, there's a big range of reasons why that happened, and we don't have time to refresh them. We can perhaps look at some of them. So I did feel in, in many ways that uh, Mangasut Butlesi, Prince Butlesi, was the missing man from a, a really the most important uh, moment of our transition and the most lasting aspect of it, which of course was the constitution. And I, I think that is a very uh, significant omission and something I think that uh, meant that the very principles for which uh, Butlesi and Encarta and then later the IFP had campaigned, federalism, free enterprise, freedom in a general sense, were perhaps more watered down than they might have been had he and the party been there. On the other hand, of course, by using a lot of pressure, and, and we can, <laughs> you've alluded to it, the quality and the nature of that pressure, uh, I think the IFP and Butlesi as its, you know, paramount head had a very significant impact on that transition. Right. Um, Dr. Stolle, you come from a fascinating perspective, the deep understanding of KwaZulu Natal, its politics and also ANC politics. How do you view <clears throat> Prince Butelezi's legacy, particularly as it relates to our democratic transition? First, let me say that um, it, it is a sad uh, moment in, in the history of our country. And um, I remember when uh, the king uh, passed away and how grateful I was just as a Zulu person that um, Prince Mangosut was alive uh, to see that transition. Because I, I, I just shuddered to think what would have happened had he not, be, had he not been around at the time when uh, the king passed away. And, um, but it is also painful that uh, he also passes away at the time when there's been this uncertainty and this tension that we have seen in the in, in the kingdom, in the royal family, and uh, and, 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 and 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 between himself and and the king, the, the ruling king at the moment. And it is he, he passed away at a very unfortunate moment because this is the time that um, we actually would have needed him to be around to see the smooth transition that all of the issues uh, are, are sorted out so that we can then have this. Zulu nation and the Zulu kingdom that he fought for so so uh, vehemently that it existed as it is today. But um, to understand the the character and the man that um, uh, uh, Prince Mangosut was, you will have to unpeel all the layers and put them aside and then pick which one do you want to look at. Because if you look at him just the, the way that uh, it's being addressed, you won't be able to understand some of the nuances and some of the issues that bothered him as, 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 as we know him today. I had the opportunity to meet with him on, in January 2020, where I went to interview him as part of our scholarship journey as we write about our history. And, um, and walking into the IFP headquarters, myself being a member of the Afri African National Congress, but understanding his role uh, in, in, in saving this nation that uh, we have today, the Zulu nation, I really wanted to hear from him what happened. And I had to be brave to ask him to say, what was, what was the reason you were not wanting to join the, the democratic um, process and wanting to join the, the, the elections? And he took his time to explain to me, and I think um, that is when I began to have a much, uh, much deeper appreciation of what was his challenges. Because you will have to understand that he's not just an ordinary South African or an ordinary chief or a politician that he, be he, became, he, he became to be. He's born of the royal family. He's also born of the, the daughter who was the, the, of the daughter of King Dinizur. And if you understand the history of the 1879 Battle of Isandlwana, 
and how after the defeat of the Zulu nation, after we had defeated the British on the 22nd of January and them defeating the Zulus on the 4th of July, this nation is stripped into pieces, is cut into 13 chiefdoms, and um, uh, King Tejao dies and he becomes the last Zulu warrior king. And then uh, Dini Zulu becomes just a chief because he had been stripped of the powers. Now you, you have to understand that um, Chief Butelezi is born much later and he's still of the view that this nation is supposed to have been intact right. as it was back then. So that has been, I understood him saying that that was his journey and that is what he ever wanted to be to make sure that this nation remains what it is. And, and, and I'm sure the accidental ambassador, uh, Leon, as I, I call him because I have this book, will have also an appreciation that um, the, if you look at the Constitution, I think chapter 12 of the Constitution, because that is what he was fighting for, the recognition of the traditional leadership and the Zulu kingdom, is just a paragraph. And it shows that it was added at the last moment because that is what he was fighting for. He says right. to me, that's what I was fighting for. And he says it's painful, I even quote him, it was painful job what was happening to the nation. And I think one has to read the history, not just of the Zulu nation, but of all the nations that were, that suffered at the hands of the colonial regime, which was the British at that time, to understand why certain fights and certain wars had to be fought. Yeah, you know? and, and we, will, we will delve into much of what has been brought out in the discussion both by Mr. Liana and Dr. Stolle. Before well, we go to, to the Can point, I just add, sorry, Caesar, to the doctor's point uh, on the sorry, credit Sorry, Mr. Liana, I will come uh, to you, but I still have another <laughs> panelist who I have to bring yeah. in, but we will have time immediately after the break, and I, I promise to come back to you. And I appreciate sure. that you do have to leave at uh, 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 halfway through our, our conversation. Uh, but but mm -hmm. Mr. Mkiva, can I come to you and just ask you about your reflections on Prince Butelezi's contribution to the democratic transition? And I'm afraid I have to ask you to be brief as we transition to our break. No, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, <clears throat> as controllers, we, we have already paid our respects uh, to the family and tried uh, to comfort uh, the family, the Butelezi clan and the Zulu royal family as well as the kingdom. But I want to say that uh, Schenge occupied a very unique position in the ecosystem of South Africa. And I would say that he is the single politician, traditional leader who had that kind of antiquity. You will realize that uh, <clears throat> as a traditional prime minister of the Zulu kingdom, he was a fierce defender of that, king of that kingdom, first and foremost. But as other colleagues have said, he, he, he is also a die-hard champion of the institution of traditional leadership and indigenous knowledge systems. He was uncompromising as a traditional leader in foregrounding the African culture and heritage. And at the same time, he became what we can say today, a seasoned politician and a statesman who was forced to strike a balance between joining the Bantu system to promote Ubukosi and siding with the liberation struggle as led by his first political home, the ANC. A fearless warrior and a legendary fighter. He was a hardliner. I mean, we can remember so many episodes about him, but the unique position that he occupies is that uh, Schenge was, was part of the first uh, ilk of parliamentarians in 1994. And then when the houses of traditional leaders were established, he was the chairman of, of, of the House of Traditional Leaders in KZN, a traditional prime minister at the same time, and the chief of his own clan. Those positions, he used them efficiently and effectively to entrench the centrality of the institution of traditional leadership in the new dispensation. Through his contribution alongside Contralesa and other, um, you know, uh, vanguard organizations he ensured that south africa is not just an ordinary republic like the rest in the continent but a republic of a special type because we are a republic that recognizes traditional leadership and it also gives them an opportunity to actually be part of the management of the national question right and when it comes to land i would say that this is one important aspect that we must highlight he was heavily criticized for insisting 
uh, on the uh, on the on the on the act which actually established the Ingwanyama Trust, and uh, today that uh, that has become a beacon of hope for many of the communal land under the stewardship of traditional leadership of the country because right. with that instrument which was really hard in, in ensuring that he negotiated for has actually benefited the rest of the traditional authorities in the country and therefore we remember him with all of that uh, and and other aspects which i can mention i know that Indeed. i'm the and only we, one that we will we will delve into more of those aspects uh, th there's a lot to unpack we will when we come back from the break explore some of the questions that have been raised in our discussion, but also foreground the question of political violence in the build-up to South Africa's democratic passage. Don't go anywhere as we understand the life and legacy of Prince Mangosutu Butelezi. Join us after the break. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're discussing the life and legacy of Prince Mangosutu Butelezi. Mr. Leon, um, I know that you have to leave us and wanted to come into our discussion. So please, please feel free to make the point that you wanted to make. And then after that, could I also ask you to reflect on, I know it's a sensitive time, of course, but there are questions about political violence in South Africa and uh, the IFP and Prince Butelezi's role in that violence and your assessment of how we should interpret mm -hmm. that in this moment. Well, sure. Thank you very much, Cesar, and apologies. I do have to leave at 2030, as I did explain uh, before this program began. No problem. Uh, look, I, on, on, the, on the plus side, or one of the plus sides of the ledger, and I just want to add to that period of tumult in the lead up to the 1994 election, extraordinarily enough, and I have to say my party at the time, although I wasn't the leader of the Democratic Party, uh, went along with the National Party and the ANC, uh, in the 1993 constitution to agree that only be one ballot. So in other words, you wouldn't be able to split your votes between a national vote and a provincial vote. And although the IFP and uh, G, uh, Prince Portlesi weren't part of the constitutional negotiations at that time, one of their major complaints was exactly that. And they demanded, among other issues before they joined the election last minute, that that be rectified. And after a lot of toing and froing, it was rectified. And we can say, no thanks to my old party, the National Party or the ANC, that actually South Africa has uh, uh, separate ballots for provincial national elections, ironically, uh, given that the beneficiaries uh, of, of that have included the party, the DA. So, I, yeah, so I, th I think that was a, a, a very big achievement. And it also proves you can sometimes achieve things by pressure from the outside, not being on the inside, which I guess would be part of the the Butelezi argument, if you like, of not being present in the room. On the issue of violence, I mean, you know, there are the objective facts and there are a lot of subjective interpretations. And we heard from Mr. Klengwa earlier in the program that I think more than 20,000 people, overwhelmingly black people, were killed during that struggle. And there were two sides to the struggle. So I think it's an absolute fool's errand to say all the fault all the attributions on one side. Uh, I think there's a lot of blame to go around. And I think, you know, there were acts of omission and commission com committed by Encarta and certainly by the ANC and the UDF. And I think that's what the record needs to show. Now, I also know because it's a matter of fact, and I was present in parliament at the time, that the security police and the entire state apparat were funneling arms to the IFP. But equally, they weren't, uh, and I don't want to put this in an indelicate way, they weren't fighting the Boy Scouts or the Girl Guides. The other side was also armed, in that case, by the Soviet Union or via the Transkai through uh, the Transkai Defense Force through a range of different mechanisms. So there was a civil war. We didn't quite call it a civil war, but there was. And there was a lot of violence. And uh, there was, when it came to accounting for the violence, that's where there was another huge disagreement. And that was the role of the TRC, the objectivity of the TRC, the bias of the TRC, the correctness of the TRC, a a and so forth. And of course, that led to any, a really an explosion in parliament ab about that, which I was also present at, and it was very unpleasant. I mean, the IFP spokesman called Bishop Tutu a 
a weeping circus presiding over a or laughing clown presiding over a weeping circus or traveling circus or extraordinary attack but equally but layers in the IFP were under sustained attack from the ANC government, of which actually, ironically at the time, uh, Principal Tlesi was a member of the cabinet. So you had all these different camps that put Lesi, and that's where the contradiction is straddled. You know, a major opposition figure, but also a member of the government of national unity and afterwards. Someone who was a traditionalist, as you've heard, achieving a lot for traditional leadership, but also a modern politician. And um, I'm not sure that all those contradictions were not so much resolved as ever resolvable. And to the extent he managed to stay upright for 95 years, right to the end, uh, is pretty remarkable. And I, I think it's absolutely correct because he was a controversial, huge figure in our public life to be highly critical on aspects of his legacy and to be very praiseworthy on other aspects. But to simply either whitewash it completely or to demonize him completely seems to me not just wrong, but historically uh, ridiculous. Right. And, and Mr. Lengwa, again, I know it's, it's a difficult and sensitive time to reflect on these questions, but uh, what's, what's your sense of how South Africans should interpret that period of, of violence um, as we reflect on this this uh, this life in this particular moment and and of course you'll 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 know very well the the, the tenor of the debate which has has run to 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 extremes I, I think you're on on mute mr Sengwa. Um you know thanks but thanks very much uh, Sizu. You know, Nelson Mandela, a great South African, in his own right, has had people calling him a sellout. In 2023 years later, not everybody agrees with Christ. So none of us are under any illusion that the life, legacy, and times of Prince Mahonso took tell you, because he was a towering figure of our body politic and national discourse, will be debated. All we ask is that it be debated fairly and accurately. And never once did he order a hit, as he has said for himself, and there's no proof to say that he did. What we won't deny is that there was a low intensity, black on black civil war, the people's war, which took 20,000 lives. And I encourage anybody to read a copy of the people's war, which details extensively what happened because we will run the risk, as I've said in another interview, where somebody will say, Prince Boutelli is he killed people. And nobody says Mr. Tambo killed people because he was the leader of the ANC, right? So what we need to say here is to extract the leaders and look at their responses to the violence and their responses to the violence was a constant call for their people not to engage in war. I, I, I find it regrettable that people would myopically arrive at an easy conclusion and say that Prince Boutelezi was a mass murderer. There's no proof for that. And I believe that the TRC did not do justice to truth and reconciliation in this country. And the fact that we are grappling with the challenges which we are now of racism, interruptions to nation building and social cohesion are an indication of a country that masquerades around the world as having mastered the art of truth and reconciliation, yet the scars lay bare, highly polarized. Right. The and second point is that Right. And, sorry, just, just round off this point and let me bring in the other panel. Yes. The, the, the second point is this. I appreciate the fact that the leadership of both the IFP and the ANC are on agreement on the key question of reconciliation. What are we reconciling? A past where the two organizations found themselves in the war in which they were. But now do you Will he nearly just say an individual did that? I don't think so. And I challenge you to present proof, chapter and verse, 
which will say Prince Mamusu Tuptilius was the mass murderer. Place it on the table. Not one will come. Because in his 95 years of life, in our post-democratic dispensation, he has never been charged because he has never committed the crimes he's been accused of. And this is not to say he was a saint. But what right. I will not accept is that he was a murderer. Dr. Stolle, um, how do you intervene in this delicate debate? It, it is a delicate uh, debate. I, I, I lived through the black on black mm. violence uh, in, 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 the, in the 80s. I was in Peter Marisbeck at the height of black on black violence. I do have scars myself uh, where I had been attacked. And, um, and uh, again, ar ar around this issue, when I'm saying you have to peel off all the layers and, and, and look at exactly what was the issue. No one has addressed what was the fight about. Because people will go to war for what they believe in. That's, that's, that's a fact. They'll go to war for what they believe in. What was the fight about? And let's put the IFP as a party and put look at Mangosutu, uh, Prince Mangosutu himself. And I think uh, as Zolani has just also spoke in detail around what he, he stood for. Mm. Was the fight about the dismantling of the Zulu nation and the kingdom? What was he supposed to do if the, if the fight was about that? So we still have to uh, look at that fight itself. Yes, people did die. And, 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 and all, I, all I know is that uh, there had been moves to Telelanamans, Kshanjululwe, um, I was I was in discussion last year and even in April this year um, uh, with um, with the leadership uh, of, of of the ANC and some some uh, traditional leaders in Egurulene who came to me and said if there's one thing that they would like to see before Prince Mangosu to uh, 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 passes away is a cleansing ceremony at Shell House because that was the last thing that um, even us as Africans and as, uh, as, 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 as we know how we deal with uh, where blood has been spilled, what you do. And that had been one of the biggest issues that needed to be addressed right. on that. And it is unfortunate that he did pass away without, without that having happened. Yes, um, and I must say that um, we were very scared of the IFP myself. Uh, when we were in the township, I come from Umlazi, but I, I, I happened to be in, in, in Peter Marisberg in Bali, in Bali, around the area of black on black violence. We would, we would run. You would just see people running and hiding. But the issue is that nobody knows what the fight was about. Maybe even if those wearing functions were to, to be asked, actually, what is it that you are fighting about? And they would ask themselves the question and try and get an answer. They would be like, actually, we are fighting amongst ourselves for one for the preservation of the land that we should keep for our dignity and our identity to be kept. So why are we then fighting? And, and, and that is the question maybe us as scholars that we need to find out, not what happened, but why what happened happened. Absolutely, and, and Mr. Mkiva, could I come to you on this question of violence, particularly in the tra transition to our democracy and, and how we should interpret that in this moment? as we reflect on the life of Prince Mutelezi? Yeah, well, I would agree with the colleagues that uh, this was a very complex uh, matter uh, in the history of our liberation struggle. And this is on the eve, of course, of the new dispensation when it happens. And you will understand that uh, apartheid was actually facing its end. And it would have stopped at nothing in ensuring that uh, it pits uh, the black community one against each other and so for me i think the starting point is that that violence was well orchestrated by an apartheid regime that was a brutal and a violent racist junta which fed on tribalism and uh, and, and human blood and uh, it needed to do that in order to defocus all of us from the main goal of our emancipation i think that's the most fundamental thing that we must talk about of course we do know that uh, Prince Mangosutu Mutelezi was a very strong character and he didn't take no nonsense from anybody who would uh, throw mud at him and uh, he would fight like a wounded tiger when it comes to that. So I'm saying that we were caught up in that situation and uh, many people, especially the, 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 the leadership of the liberation movement, saw him 
uh, 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 siding with the apartheid forces or forces of apartheid assisting him or supporting his party and they saw him as a stand as a stumbling block and that created the fuss and uh, which led uh, to this black on black violence so as i say i agree that there has never been any inquiry on actually the underlying factors of that violence uh, which has come up with 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 a clear outcome of of of, of what was at play but we can clearly uh, be be sure that uh, the apartheid regime itself was central. Some people talk about the third force, but I think the first force, which is a force uh, which was really feeding on violence, is the apartheid state itself. Right. Uh, and, and other matters were actually very secondary. So at this juncture, I would leave it at that because mm. at this point, as Africans, I think we don't want to dwell much on the negatives. We want to let this process of mourning uh, actually go through and pay our respects and focus on the positives Indeed. that we can actually profit out of the life and times of Ushenge as we know him. And, so and let's, I, I, let's I leave it there. I'm sure that let's this leave reflection it there for now. is going to continue beyond the, the we, funeral. Indeed, and let's leave it there for now. Mr. Leon, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you. We, thank you very much for having me. And I send my condolence and respects to the IFP and the Botlesi family, of course. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back after the break as we discuss the question of the 1994 election and that crucial and formative mo moment in our nation's history. Don't go anywhere as we delve deeper into the life and legacy of Prince Mangosuthu Butelezi and South Africa's democratic transition. Welcome back to Unfiltered. Three days after his passing, we're discussing the life and legacy of Prince Mangosutu Butelezi. A fascinating irony of that story, Dr. Stoles, that both former President Nelson Mandela and Prince Mangosutu Butelezi were granted 95 years on this earth. And their stories were intertwined, but of course, maybe it came to a head at the moment of the 1994 election. Mm. And tonight we're looking at the transition to democracy. Mm. How do you? look at and interpret that moment and Prince Butelezi's role in that moment of the 1994 election. On the one hand, maybe giving the country its, its biggest uh, challenge, but also on the other hand, finally agreeing to that election, which allowed finally our democratic passage. I think personally I'd been at seven months back in the country. So all mm. I had remembered was the violence of the 80s mm. because I had left in the 80s. The other violence that I had seen, I had seen it on television. I was already um, uh, uh, somewhere, not in South Africa. So I was fresh, but with old memories. And, 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 and I had seen that the, the country was there, was, there was tension. We were on the brink of another second civil war, probably it was going to be worse than what we had seen in the 90s. Hmm. And, and, and we know that the, 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 the one person who was holding the future of the country was Prince Mangosut Putelis. Because, I mean, uh, we have to accept that that part of, part of the country is, 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 holds a significant stake in terms of peace and stability sure. in South Africa as a whole. And without that part of the country agreeing to be part of a, democ a democratic dispensation, it wasn't going to happen. And probably more blood shed would have been, I mean, no more blood would have been shed. I personally remember that I was staying uh, somewhere in a, in a flat in, in Parktown North when an announcement that um, uh, the IFP had agreed to participate in the national elections for a post-apartheid uh, South Africa. I, I went out and I stood out in the balcony and I just breathed fresh air. It just, it was so overwhelming because I knew what that participation meant for the country because I could now see that the, my memories of this 80s were now going to be wiped away because we're now all excited, looking forward into what would, what would become of the country as we now elect a, a democratic, democratically led um, uh, um, uh, government by a black president, uh, depending what the outcome of the elections was going to be. Absolutely, Mr. Mkiva, what do you make of that, of that moment, particularly the 94 election in which on the one hand, the country was on tenterhooks, and then on the other, on the eve of the election, 
uh, the breakthrough was made, and of course, Prince Mutelezi was right at the center of that of that juncture of our history. Well, <clears throat> I think as uh, Dr. Stolle puts it, you know, we were all worried that uh, the stance that he had taken was going to lead to to the area which we know now as uh, Zululand and part of KZN not being part of the new South Africa. Remember that Kodasa 1 and Kodasa 2 collapsed and um, <clears throat> which then led to the Kempton Park negotiations being the final result to the new South Africa. And out of that, <clears throat> because of his insistence, um, many people benefited because for the first time in the table, there were delegations that came predominantly now from the other three uh, previous apartheid provinces, which is the Transvaal area, as well as a uh, part of uh, the Cape Colony, which is uh, the, the northern part, uh, which is um, Northern Cape today. Then there were four delegations of traditional leaders, which were given for each at the Kempton Park. But <clears throat> having said that, uh, I think the fact that Schenge also had a high regard for Madiba, uh, it, because it is Nelson Mandela was able to persuade him to actually come to the party. Uh, remember that their history dates back from the time of, of their student life uh, and the youth mm -hmm. league life. And, and at least Madiba was able uh, to touch his soul and to appeal to his conscience uh, in ensuring that the people of KZN are not left up. But what was also interesting, which I think was being put to test, is that I think there was an issue of who was uh, commanding the numbers in terms of support. There was a belief that uh, he had numbers and the liberation movement had a belief that it had numbers. Then it had to be proved in the ballot, wherein actually the IFP won the KZN in that election of 1994. And I think uh, one of the things that made him to win that election is the fact that he entered that race um, having almost uh, galvanized the support for predominantly Zulu-speaking people in KZN on his side, um, uh, which I think is what actually worked into his favor to win that first election. It was indeed a difficult moment, but also a moment of excitement when he finally entered that election because it meant that we all had to traverse and journey towards the same destiny of a new South Africa as we happen to know it today. Uh, that, 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 that's how I would say about that period. Mr. Tlengwa, that was a, a crucial moment in the, in the life of Prince Mutelezi. How do you understand that, that decision? And perhaps you, having had some proximity, may have heard some of the stories of, the, of that moment. Can you, can you give us some insight into how you see that decision, that crucial decision for our country in 1994, finally to join the election, to join the ballot? I, I believe there were stickers on the ballot that had to be put on. So late was, was the hour. Um, but that was clearly in a, in a very large and eventful life, one of the key turning points, politically at least. No, absolutely. And I think credit must be given to Professor um, Okumo of Kenya, yes. who actually <clears throat> facilitated that deal uh, which saw the IFP participating in the elections, precisely because it ensured that commitments were made which were never fulfilled, insofar as the powers, functions and responsibilities and status of His Majesty and their Majesties and the traditional leaders and the institution of traditional leadership in South Africa post-1994. To the extent to which in December 2000, a cabinet committee chaired by the then Deputy President, Mr. Jacob Zuma, made a recommendation that in furtherance of the commitments of 1994, chapter seven and 12 of the constitution must be amended in order to answer the question of the powers, functions, and responsibilities of traditional leaders. It was not done. Key amongst that was the issue of land. And I think that uh, Mr. Mkiva has touched um, on this particular um, aspect. So, we, we, and I appreciate, uh, Jobe, when you say we need to go back to answer the critical questions which informed the discourse 
which landed us where we are. The one perspective which we must look at is that one, when the IFP was founded, or INCAT was founded, it was founded as a front of the African National Congress, hence the usage of the liberation colors in 1975. A meeting took place in 1979 in London of a delegation of both the IFP and the ANC to answer the critical questions of sanctions and the arms struggle, which the IFP presented that it does not agree with. Because there was no violence between the IFP and the ANC at that time. And this was in December 1979. And when the IFP had presented its side of the story, the ANC leadership said, we will come back to you on, with responses. That never happened. Instead, what happened was, was a clarion call that Mutele is, is a snake that must be hit on the head. When the UDF was founded, in their statement, initial statement, they welcomed everybody but the IFP, giving then and opening the door to what began in September 1984. So as we go back to that uh, job, as you say, and I appreciate your perspective and respect it and your experiences, as we go back to unpeeling the layers, we need to then look at the transition in relationships between INCAT and the ANC from 1975 at its founding to that crucial meeting of 1979, which sadly was the parting of ways. That will help us understand that we cannot then place responsibility and blame on one man. The third point, which is of crucial uh, importance, and I think um, it, will be, it will be helpful, is to say that the IFP leadership and the ANC leadership are, are, are talking and making pronouncements, which we owe it to South Africans to follow through when they speak about reconciliation. Because in 1999, Mr. Mpegi, as president of the ANC, and Prince Mangosu Tupteli as president of the IFP, unveiled a memorial in Togoza of names of victims of both the ANC and the IFP. In fact, when President Mbegi made the offer to Prince Mutelezi to be deputy president in 1999 after the elections, it was a continuation of the reconciliation project. And so right. I, I do believe that there's a lot of research and work that needs to go into answering the critical questions that are on the table. Hence, I call the reaction to the passing of Prince Mangosu Tupteleze, which casts blame, as a knee-jerk reaction which stretches, uh, uh, which is lazy research. It's a lazy response to a critical aspect um, of nation okay. building because it's about the reconciliation of black uh, people, which is necessary for the futuristic discourse. And I think we owe it to our forebears um, to actually conclude this matter in a manner that takes the nation uh, forward. Dr. Mm. Stolia, as, as we conclude, how would you uh, offer your final thoughts on, on this question and, and perhaps also the, the question that's been posed towards the end of Mr. Sengwa's response mm. there about the reconciliation of ANC and IFP, particularly as we go into an election where that reconciliation may have important political consequences? First, let me say that um, I, I have had such an appreciation of what I've seen as a response from all organs of our society since the passing away of Prince Mangosutu. It shows that we are a matured democracy. The fact that we've got all the political parties streaming to that household, to Wapindangen, uh, uh, to, to pay their respects. Actually, it is a recognition of the role and the position that uh, Mangosutu held in South Africa, on the continent, and, 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 and elsewhere in the world. Because had that been, if there were still uh, uh, um, unanswered questions and, uh, about the stature that the man was, we wouldn't be seeing all of these political parties going there. I mean, we're talking about almost all the political parties have, uh, have gone there. I think also the matter that needs to be addressed is we take this as a lesson. Uh, I mean, I, I always had hopes um, leading to our democracy that we 
we were the last uh, country to uh, to achieve uh, whatever you call the democracy is today that we are going to learn from the the mistakes of the past in other countries and uh, and that we, we also take this uh, uh, as a lesson. Of course, we also know uh, that um, uh, there were certain things that should have happened around Mdona Pindange and uh, uh, the, the order of uh, uh, Lutuli uh, that had been uh, proposed, but was also vehemently opposed by people who still have but so, so much hatred and, and grudges for the person that it never happened. And that maybe this is also the time that he, he is honored uh, with that order uh, posthumously. And lastly, that um, the, this, this cleansing ceremony that the, the, the people have asked for, that it happens at, right. uh, at, 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 at Shell House. And then on a lighter note, uh, I always liked Mkulego um, Shenga's previous hairstyle, man. It was very revolutionary, and then he shaved it. Uh, I always look, I'm like, I wish he still had that hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'll to it, uh, <laughs> well, Mr. Mkiva, I won't, uh, I won't focus on, on the question of hair too much as, as I come to you at, at the end, but um, um, lighter notes are always welcome. Uh, your, your concluding thoughts, your concluding thoughts. <laughs> yeah, well, I think on that note, we must also say that uh, Schenge was actually a politician with a lot of charisma and humor. He was able to sing and lead Amabuto on several accounts and uh, but I, I want to say that the reconciliation project is an unfinished project which needs to continue and uh, it should not also happen as something that of u utopian level it must be reconciliation that is based on real issues that affect south africans including the land question the restoration of land is key the restoration of wealth to the African majority is quite key. The issue of mainstreaming the indigenous knowledge system as part and parcel of the policy making in South Africa is also part of that reconciliation. And uh, <clears throat> to a great degree, when we speak about reconciliation, we still insist that the difference between the powers and functions as they manifested in the interim constitution and beyond the 8th of May, right. uh, 1996, when the new constitution was adopted, is an issue that remains unresolved. Indeed. It also is linked to reconciliation. I therefore wish that uh, we must appeal to the broader section of South Africa, especially those who uphold uh, the vast stretches of land, as well as the wealth of this country, to ensure that what Madiba had started in 1994 uh, is actually continued right uh, uh, so that we can bring uh, you know stability uh, to this country and ensure that we have a future that Indeed. actually can 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 ensure that there is a lasting peace in in our society Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mkiva. Thank you very much to our entire panel tonight for a fascinating exploration of the life and legacy of Prince Mangosutu Butelezi, notwithstanding various hairstyles. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening as we have inquired into a life that straddled two centuries, tumult, political fervor, and ultimately a period of intense debate and reflection for our nation. Join us again for unfiltered news, unfiltered views, and unfiltered conversations in the next installment. Have a good night.